But um, before we return back to those statements uh, in a little bit, we, uh, we have our final panel for this weekend. Um, assembly members, you know them well, but for the purposes of the live stream, I'm going to, um, to give them uh, a proper introduction again. Uh, so we're going to hear uh, from uh, two panellists um, on uh, the question of um, well, some of the key issues uh, to think about, um, about kind of how we practically might achieve net zero. And so we'll hear from uh, Chris Stark um, from the Committee on Climate Change, obviously one of our expert leads you know well, and Professor Rebecca Willis, again, uh, one of our expert leads from uh, Lancaster University. So same, uh, same kind of format applies to, to this panel as before. Uh, they're going to talk for about 10 minutes. At the end of the 10 minutes, we're going to give you a little bit of time at your table to, to note down any questions, but please do feel free to note questions as we go. It's a reminder that you have the red and yellow cards on your table. Um, I think we might have missed a couple of red cards yesterday, so we'll do a bit better at spotting them uh, today. Uh, but um, if, uh, if you, the speakers are speaking too fast, then stick up a yellow card and they will slow down. If uh, one of their points doesn't, uh, if you're not quite sure what they meant, then put up a red card and they will uh, stop and they'll repeat the points, hopefully in a more <laughs> understandable fashion. So I think that's all from me for now. So I'll hand over to Chris to, to start off. Thanks, Tim. Let's see if we can get these slides working. So hello again, everybody. Um, now, I don't mind saying that this is the bit I have some trepidation about. So I'm going to try and, um, in this session, talk about the steps that lead to net zero. So yesterday, if you can imagine, um, when we were thinking about how we would plan the weekends, yesterday was really about climate change itself. So the science, um, some of the impacts that it's causing, and some of the, um, uh, the more philosophical questions about climate change. Um, very deliberately, so we wanted you to understand that. What you'll be dealing with really from now on is the solutions, so the, the, the things that need to be done to reduce emissions and to get to that goal of net zero overall. So just to begin, net zero, um, and we'll keep repeating this, uh, net zero, the goal, means balancing completely uh, the emissions that are released into the atmosphere with uh, the various things that we can do to take them back out of the atmosphere, and we'll talk about that in just a second, and balancing them at zero overall. Uh, hence net zero. So I will talk about in a second how that can be done, um, but I want to preface this by saying, uh, I mean, this is the work that, that I do uh, day in, day out, but I do not claim to be standing in front of you with an answer about this, and I, don't, I want to make that very clear. What I'm going to give you is an example of how the UK might reach that net zero goal. And the reason I want to do it like this is because I want to give you a sense of how um, how integrated this question is. So we've been hearing a lot about climate change and emissions, and that can be you know, quite, a, quite a difficult topic in and of itself. But the solutions um, have lots and lots of implications. So what I'll, what I'll show you is an example of how the UK could get to net zero in as, in as simple a way as I can. Mainly it's about, rather than the kind of um, the strategies and the, quanti the quantity of the things that I'll talk about, it's more about seeing how these things fit together. So. That's what I hope I can talk to you about in the next um, five or so minutes. We're going to be talking about these three things. Um, energy supply, energy use, and land use. And they're, they're very broadly the topics that, that you will need to think about too. And we're going to, after this, we're going to, we're going to take you through in the next weekends uh, some of these issues in, in much more detail to allow you to make some decisions about the things that I'm about to tell you about. OK, does that sound OK? All right, so let's begin then. So um, we, we heard yesterday lots and lots of things about what's causing climate change, so what's causing them, uh, and in particular about greenhouse gas emissions. So the challenge is to change what's, what we're at pre doing at present to, um, to create those greenhouse gas emissions and to change what we do at present uh, to bring carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and to store it away. So, that matters immensely because of these things, energy supply, energy use and land use, which are utterly fundamental to the way that we live our lives in the UK. 
And I'm going to start with energy supply, and let's start first with electricity generation. Um, now, at the moment, because of the things that we've been doing over the last uh, 10, 15, maybe a bit, even a bit longer years in the UK, at the moment, half of the electricity that's supplied to you, roughly, in, in any one year, it comes from what we would call low carbon means. That's either nuclear power uh, or renewable power. And I, don't worry, we'll talk to you about what that means in a second. But think about it. nuclear power stations, which don't cause those greenhouse gas emissions, or wind power. Um, so half of, at the moment, uh, uses uh, zero carbon, and half uses fossil fuels, like coal and like gas. Now, this is what we talked about yesterday, if you remember the pie chart that I showed you all. So we've about 50% of the supply of electricity now at the moment is zero carbon. That, by the way, is pretty remarkable statistic. Um, other countries around the world haven't achieved that level of, uh, and this is a word you'll hear a lot about, decarbonisation so far. Um, so that's something that the UK uh, has already achieved, but it is not enough, not nearly enough, to get to the goal of net zero overall. So what we need to do uh, is, to, is to finish the job, if you like, and, and, and complete that task of fully decarbonised electricity production. Um, now, I've used, a, I've used a, a windmill there. Um, it can be achieved through uh, wind, or it could be done through nuclear power. Um, I, 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 please don't take that to mean that it's just, a, just wind that we're going to use here, but it's, it's just a, 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 an icon to try and demonstrate what we're trying to do here. So finishing that job of getting to fully decarbonised electricity, and then we have to think about all this stuff. And this is all the ways that we use energy at the moment and the ways in which we use energy at the moment by and large involve lots and lots of use of fossil fuels. So at the top there, you see the buildings that we have in the UK. Um, in broad numbers, there's about 30 million. Um, and they are, they are mostly heated entirely, actually, from, uh, mostly from fossil fuels. And mostly, that fossil fuel, the one that we use most, is, is gas, natural gas. We have, in the UK, one of the most extensive networks of gas uh, anywhere in the world. And we've spent a long time building it and constructing it. Um, so mostly, buildings are heated from uh, fossil fuels and from the gas system in the main. And beneath that, you've got, the, you've got the road transport system, the surface transport system, which is, I mentioned yesterday, the biggest single source of emissions when we look at all the bits of that pie chart. That's cars and vans. Then beneath that, you've got um, uh, more vehicles. Uh, you've got heavy goods vehicles, um, trucks. You've got tractors, the things that you'll find on, on farms. And you've got uh, boats, ships, all of which use fossil fuels to, um, to move around. And then at the bottom, uh, is industry. You remember that part of the chart that we showed yesterday, about a fifth of emissions overall. Now, that's how we use energy at the moment. We have to decarbonise those um, uses of energy through various different means. One of the ways we can do that is by having more clean electricity, so more low carbon, zero carbon electricity. Um, in, this, in this example, we double the amount of electricity that is being produced in the UK from what we produce at present. And if we do that, then we can electrify many of the things that presently we use fossil fuels for. So let me just briefly explain what that means. So think about the top box there, which is buildings, 30 million buildings, mostly heated from the gas system. It is possible to heat those buildings using electricity instead of gas. Um, and we can use things that you will hear about, I won't go into detail now, things like heat pumps, which take energy from outside of the home using electricity to create heat inside the home. Um, we don't have many of them at the moment, but it's possible to do that. We can, something I'm sure a lot of you will have heard of, we can have electric vehicles on the road. So we can, um, there are, at the moment, there are nearly 40 million vehicles on the road and they all use petrol and diesel. Um, it, in this example, they are all electric by mid-century, by 2050. Um, uh, and there's a dotted line here around the truck and the tractor because some of those things we think could be electrified as well. So we could have electric, electric basis for um, uh, some heavy goods transportation and some uh, machinery on farms. And some of the industrial uh, processes can also be electrified. So it's possible to use electricity to create some of the process heat, for example, that presently has got, uh, that we use fossil fuels for. So we can use more electricity and we can use more clean electricity 
to address these things overall. Um, but it's not enough. So um, we also need something to replace that. And uh, it's a, a fuel that can be used to replace those applications where we can't use electricity. And uh, in this example, we're using a fuel called hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is the most abundant uh, thing in the entire universe. It's, uh, you find it very often in, in stars. Um, it's everywhere, but it isn't found naturally as a gas. You can't, you, know, you can't just go out and find some hydrogen. So you have to put, go through a process to create it. Uh, and we do create hydrogen at the moment through an industrial process, but we do that by using natural gas in the main and uh, turning it into hydrogen, releasing carbon dioxide, which is one of the greenhouse gases. So nothing's easy. <laughs> so we can go through a different process to create hydrogen, and then we have, a, we have a clean fuel that we can use in alternative applications. And in this example, that's what we do. So it turns green there. I'm sorry, the, the slides look like they've, they've come out slightly differently. But the, there's an H hiding underneath that green uh, circle, if you see it, H2. Now, green hydrogen just means hydrogen that's been produced without creating those greenhouse gases, and we'll talk to you about that too. But you can do that through one of two ways. One is that you can pass an electrical current across water, and um, you might have done that in school, in your chemistry class. Uh, you create a gas that pops when you light it. That's hydrogen. So that's, uh, that's one way of doing that. We call it electrolysis. And the other way of doing it is to take natural gas and to turn it into hydrogen, but capture the carbon. And I'll talk to you about that in a second as well. But that doesn't then create the greenhouse gas that, that we were talking about yesterday. So that's hydrogen. If you have hydrogen, that's very useful, but we don't have enough of it at the moment to replace those areas where we can't use electricity. So in this example, we scale up the production of hydrogen tenfold, so 10 times the amount of hydrogen that we produce at the moment, and we do that all without causing those greenhouse gas emissions. And if we have that amount of hydrogen overall, we can then use it in a few other things in our energy use bit of this chart. So you can use it as a replacement uh, in, your, in a boiler. You can have a different sort of boiler in your house. At the moment, you have a natural gas boiler, probably most of you. You could have a hydrogen boiler instead, and we would pipe hydrogen to some homes in the UK in this, in this example. Hydrogen can also be used in transport as a fuel um, in what's called a hydrogen fuel cell, which is where you put hydrogen into the car. You don't actually burn it, it's not combusted. It goes through a chemical process and it can create electricity which then can fuel these things. And you can use it um, in industry as a replacement for, in particular, natural gas. So that's hydrogen. Um, and what's uh, also possible in industry is that you can keep burning fossil fuels but capture the carbon. So that's a process called carbon capture and you then can store it. And that is a well, um, uh, that is a, a well investigated process but we don't do it at scale at the moment. So it's possible to capture that carbon and then pipe it down into in particular where we used to have oil and gas reserves and uh, put it back under the ground where it goes into safe geological storage. Now that might sound like a, like a difficult concept, but it's, um, it's, it's, we understand quite a lot about what could be done there. So we can keep using fossil fuels as long as we capture the carbon, nearly at the end. There are some uses and some causes of emissions where we can't, we can't use hydrogen, we can't use electricity, at least not, not in any credible scale at the moment. And that, one of those is aviation. So we think that, in particular for long-haul aviation, there isn't an alternative to fossil fuels because you get a particular amount of energy from using that fossil fuel for in particular kerosene. And the other one is agriculture. So we talked yesterday about livestock causing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so those things sit there and I'll just briefly go through that. So for those things that we can't then get the emissions down, we've got to think about what we can do to take the gases out of the atmosphere to replace it, to, to, to net it off at zero. So for that, we need to change how we use land. And to free up land, we also have to think about things like what we eat. So if we're going to use land in a different way, we need to think about using, doing less of some of the agricultural stuff that we do at the moment. Um, we can plant trees, and they absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, uh, that's roughly how many trees we, we plant at the moment each year. Um, if we scale that, in this example, scale that up roughly threefold, um, you can, this, is a, this is compatible overall with the example I'm giving you here. So this is the amount of trees that we are planting in this, in this example. 
Um, and we can also do something on agricultural land, which is we can plant crops, which you can then use in energy. So you can burn those crops. They're called bioenergy crops. And we can use those for things like generating electricity as well, as long as we capture the carbon from it. So we can link all this up, if I can you can see that, you can see that we link the carbon dioxide storage with those bioenergy crops and we can create energy and store carbon overall. And that has a use in other parts of the energy system as well. And the last thing in this example that we could play around with is the demand for the things left that still cause the emissions. So our use of, for example, planes, um, what we eat, so eating less of uh, the, the, in particular, the livestock that cause the emissions, so red meat and dairy. And we can play around with that a little bit um, by, by demanding less and using less of those things that cause the emissions. This, in very broad outline, is an example of how the UK could reach net zero. The kind of proportions that you see there are accurate, and it's, of course, very deliberate. Uh, it's very simple and, and very deliberate, so, uh, deliberately so. Uh, but what I really wanted to land with you is how integrated, how interconnected, how connected all of these things are. So in particular, think, some, think about something like land use. So it's not, it's, it's not as simple as saying we need to grow lots of trees, although that would help. We also need to think about what we're not doing on that land if you're going to do that. Now, what we're going to do over the successive weekends is divide this stuff up into meaningful chunks to allow you to make meaningful decisions about some of these things. So. What I've talked to you about is an example of how you could get to net zero. Other examples are available. So we really, need to, we really need to understand what you think about these things and what things you want to do more of and what things you want to do less of. And we'll give you as much information as we can to help you make that decision overall. But the challenge itself is, is one of the most challenging things that a country could ever set for itself. And the last thing I'll say is that that is the implication of the net zero target that Parliament has now set for the UK. It is a huge mission overall. So thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much to uh, Chris for that. So a couple of minutes now just to note down any questions on your table and uh, pass them across to your facilitator.